I think Godzilla is a very human driven movie. You need people. You need to have the perspective of the lay person who is going against this force of nature to give context. Otherwise, it's just a guy in a rubber suit. Hello, and welcome to My Favorite Movie Is, a podcast all about why we love our favorite movies. My name is Larry Freed, and I am the creator and host of this show, and thank you so much for tuning in. For those of you especially who are tuning in after checking out our first two episodes of the show, thank you for sticking around. I really appreciate it. For today's episode, we're talking to my good friend and lover of all things retro gaming, Asai Nero Tran, all about his favorite movie, the tokusatsu classic, and the first in what is, at the time of this recording, the longest-running film franchise of all time, the 1954 black-and-white seminal Japanese classic, Godzilla. It didn't create tokusatsu as a genre, but Gojira really refined what the modern like definition of it is. It, it really gave texture to what those types of media should include. Despite how well-known Godzilla is in the mainstream today, some of you may be surprised to see that his original film outing is actually an incredibly grounded, humanistic drama about our choices and our relationship to nature and society. Uh, it's an incredibly beautiful film, and it was great to talk to Asai, who is really just a well of knowledge on this entire franchise, all about how timeless this movie is and how more modern adaptations of the character have perhaps strayed too far from these original dramatic roots. Before we go any further, just be warned, we are going way past the red tape and deep into spoilers on this one, as we do with every movie on My Favorite Movie Is. So find the original Godzilla, watch it. It's public domain, so it shouldn't be that hard. And then come back to us and listen to this incredibly insightful conversation and maybe learn a thing or two about the most well-known tokusatsu franchise ever. However, if you don't have time to see Godzilla, I get it, it's a bit of a time commitment, you can always just check out another episode of My Favorite Movie Is, either on our show page on your podcasting platform of choice or on our YouTube channel. Uh, we've covered a variety of films on this show. I'm sure you can find one that you like and you want to hear us talk about. However, the rest of you are here to hear us discuss the king of the monsters himself. So without any further ado, Asai, give them what they came for. My name is Asainiro Tran, and my favorite movie is 1954's Gojira. Asai, welcome to the show. Welcome to My Favorite Movie Is. It's a pleasure to have you here. How are you doing? Doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing well, especially being here. Getting to talk to you for a little bit. When I first asked you to be on the show, we talked a little bit about uh, Godzilla, which is your film of choice today. The 1955 original film. 54. Uh, the Japanese. 54. Ugh. Well, take away my film card <laughs> now. Uh, today, we're talking about Godzilla. 1954, directed by Ishido Honda. I want you to tell me about, if you can recall, your first experience watching this film. Who were you with? How did you watch it? What were the what was the circumstances or the context? When you watched it for the first time, could you tell that this movie was gonna like leave a lasting impact on you? I can tell you the story. It's it's I probably don't have anything super artistic about the first time I watched it because I, I think I was like three or four. Well, I, that's that's pretty that's pretty incredible though that you watched this film for the first time. And I'm very curious to, to hear about that. Yeah. So when I was younger, we spent some time. Uh, overseas we lived overseas for a little bit uh we were in vietnam and vietnam and japan being trading partners we got a lot of official and also bootleg japanese product there was a guy who would come by on a bicycle and he had a milk crate tied to the back and he had various bootlegs and legit copies of films and television shows and we used to rent them for maybe a thousand down which is a vietnamese currency that's probably about a nickel in real money not real it's, it is a real money but in american <laughs> currency sorry uh it's, it's probably funny. about a, just, a nickel just funny just funny before you talk about godzilla do you recall any other films that you watched in this method yeah 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 so um we rented a lot of tom and jerry which it's just easy because oh that's awesome yeah there's no language in that very few episodes of tom right. and jerry have talking so he's right. just like a fun cartoon to watch. But yeah, we would rent a lot of stuff from this guy. Uh, Gojira was one of them. And it didn't like change my life in a sense of like, 
oh my god, right. this I mean, is you're incredible. so young, you know. But you know, it, I thought it was a really fun, great movie, uh, especially compared. Like it was different from everything else. Tom and Jerry is just itchy and scratchy. The, the violence right. is everywhere. Just chaos and destruction to the max. Yeah. And then like another one I watched all the time over there was like Zeus and Roxanne, a movie with Steve Gutenberg for some reason about a dog that befriends a dolphin. So like compared to that, Godzilla's fantastic all time <laughs> great, the, the greatest film ever made. Nothing I mean, against Steve Gutenberg. It sounds like you had a very eclectic uh, <laughs> well, it, it wasn't uh, like, eclectic library there. Yeah, it wasn't like I had a choice. No, you had no choice, of course. You just got whatever. Side note, I asked my mom recently, like, whatever happened to that guy? Do we keep in touch with him? She said, he's a doctor now. So <laughs> <laughs> my Godzilla and Tom and Jerry renting put him through medical school, I would like to believe. <laughs> so that was the first time I watched it. Like I said, we were in Vietnam. I probably watched it with my, my grandmother. She loved watching movies with me because she that was like one of the ways that we would bond that was the first kind of first watch for me godzilla feels like one of those things for me when i was first introduced to it uh that i sort of only experienced through osmosis you know i didn't really uh have an appreciation for its roots or its origins and i feel like a lot of people know about godzilla primarily through the campy stuff you know the random clips of the guys in suits fighting you know that you'd see on youtube or something for camp but in reality it really is a completely different film than i think what a lot of people would expect from having absorbed it i mean the thing with godzilla uh, as a series is that it has eras so each era kind of encompasses a different genre style of the character of of Godzilla. The earlier films are really pretty dramatic uh in terms of like this is not about a goofy tokusatsu monster coming to destroy the city. You know, it it, it becomes that. Yeah, can you just for the people who may not be as familiar, can you just define the term tokusatsu and just talk a little bit about that? So tokusatsu means in a very broad respect, it just means like special effect, but the way that you interpret it today, it specifically means the style of film and television that kaiju movies are. So Ultraman, Gojira, uh, Power Rangers even, that is a tokusatsu. Uh, the term meaning special effect, it predates film. It's, it's like a stage play thing. So this was something they did before, but they obviously couldn't create a Godzilla style stage play Back well, in, not you know, back the, then. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, if King Kong get if King Kong can get a stage play, <laughs> Godzilla is not far off. Godzilla was not like I'm saying it didn't create tokusatsu as a genre, but Gojira really refined what the modern like definition of it is. It it really gave texture to what those types of media should include, like. You saying miniatures, guy in a suit, very practical, um, and and it's evolved, you know, lately more computer effects, but the core structure of a film still has to include like you know giant monster, big city kind of thing. Early films are really about like oh this this is a natural disaster. Uh, actually, no, it's not about natural. It's it's a man made disaster. Right, but it's 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 codified in the language of natural disasters, the way in which it goes down. Yeah, so it's 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 shown as a natural disaster, but it is very like constantly established that oh, this creature is a, is a result of man meddling with things that man should not meddle with. Uh, I think that those themes are very powerful. I think that they're timeless in a way that a lot of even casual viewers could watch and. Uh, connect with and understand. I don't think the 1954 Godzilla movie is an easy film to watch if your only yeah, exposure with Godzilla is, oh, this is where this lizard fights this lizard kind of movie. If you're used to that, this is not like, uh, it, it, this movie is a lot more about patience and subtlety and kind of the, the, the conflict of the human condition. First of all, you know, it's black and white. Um, which at the time, you know, color film wasn't popularized at this point, but it was certainly possible and it was available. And if you wanted to, you could 
create a film in color. But I think the choice to film this in black and white even puts it at an even starker contrast because I feel like so many, I mean, I feel like people know Godzilla as green. I mean, part of that is the 98 film, which we're not even going to discuss beyond this point. You know, I feel like everyone assumes he's sort of this like, I wouldn't say he's super colorful, but again, you look at all this footage, it's all in color. It's kind of campy. There's the green that you associate with Godzilla. But in this film, it's all black and white. And he's really just black. He's almost completely black over the course of the entire film. He's corrupted almost in shadows. Godzilla historically is black because it's just like a, a a big rubber suit. And then in the American movies, he's he's still black. Um, the green may have been like a... What's that? Roland Emmerich, like a color correcting choice. Oh, yeah, right. Because he directed oh. the 97 film. I think he did Independence Day and these other films. And he, he, he has like a very specific kind of uh, color grading uh, choice that he likes to make with his films. The black and white of the 54 movie, I, part of me wonders if it was a deliberate choice. Part of me wonders if it was like a budgetary choice. Because like, you know, we live in America and there's not a lot of, you know, hustle and bustle about how are we going to do this this big budget movie because you know we spend millions hundreds of millions of dollars on film over here well in you know overseas japan they don't have that kind of budget so i wonder if it was like oh we, we couldn't afford multiple color cameras for this and the movie is you know fairly low budget for for what yeah. it is and then i wonder how much of it was like okay but this creature will look better in black and white in color it'll be easier to tell that it's a guy in a suit technically it's two guys <laughs> in a suit over the course of the film really yeah oh well they goodness. not not simultaneously <laughs> like right not simultaneously <laughs> but i mean this uh, the suit weighed like probably a hundred a uh, hundred kilograms so like maybe a hundred 160 pounds that's insane yeah so the the main actor they cast he could only film for like three four minutes at a time before he would right. like black out from exhaustion and so they replaced him with another actor so they could do other shots a lot of the shots they did they only film like his foot stepping on something and that's because he's just like a guy he's in a t-shirt and then the the bottom half is Godzilla's legs walking. And he's through. carrying the legs like with his body to like crush a car yeah. or something. Uh, at the end of production, I think it, if I remember correctly, I think he said he lost maybe 25 pounds just sweating <laughs> from carrying around the suit. I imagine the movie in color and certain parts seem like they would be better, but certain parts seem significantly worse. Like when he uses atomic breath, I mean, it's literally just like a cloud. Like in the original yeah. movie, it's a cloud. <laughs> Like, it, it looks literally, like, it literally just looks like an airstream. Yeah, it looks like it looks somewhere. like he just hit like a, a a vape, and he's just like, you know what? <laughs> I'm gonna cover this in blueberry pomegranate f smell. Like it's, it, yeah, I feel like that part would look markedly worse in color. Either way, it's still, in my opinion, the correct choice. The destruction shots, like revel in the darkness shadows obviously help with the visual effects when you're trying to combine humans and godzilla i think of that one shot where you know godzilla takes up the top of the frame and he's walking and all the humans are on the bottom of the frame and not even with godzilla but think about other shots like think about the um the tsunami shot uh in the, uh, closer to the beginning of the film i can't really imagine that in color either i think the starkness of the black and white is what gives the film its dramatic quality Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying this week's episode of My Favorite Movie Is. I hate to interrupt this awesome conversation, but I just wanted to remind you all that you can find more episodes of My Favorite Movie Is by going to our show page on your podcasting platform of choice. And if you like video podcasts, we actually post our video versions for every podcast episode on YouTube. New audio episodes drop every other Monday, and then video episodes drop that following Friday. So I hope you'll subscribe and follow us and hit that notification bell and do all the things you got to do to stay updated on when new episodes go live. Another way to stay updated on when new episodes go live and get some fun bonus content and sneak peeks in between episodes is to follow us on our social media pages at MFMI Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. I hope you guys will find us there and stay updated and check out all the cool stuff we're doing on those platforms. And finally, for a full catalog of audio and video episodes, as well as more information about the show and how you can contact us for any reason, you can go to mfmipodcast.com. 
Thank you so much for listening to My Favorite Movie Is. Let's get back to the show. I think obviously anybody who has even a passing familiarity with Godzilla will understand that the story is obviously um, an allegory to nuclear war and man-made bombs and man-made destruction and the evils of that. I think that that is kind of ground that has been tread. I'm a little bit more interested in talking to you a little bit about um, one of the things that really struck me about this film, which is, as you mentioned earlier, how much it really is about the human condition and how much it is really about the human characters. My first exposure to Godzilla was the 2014 MonsterVerse film, and I hadn't seen any of the original Godzillas. I knew who Godzilla was, obviously, and I remember, myself included, which feels shameful for me to say because I rewatched the film in lieu of Godzilla v Kong, and I actually really enjoyed the 2014 Godzilla a lot more than I did before. But one of my complaints when I first saw the film was, look at all, get all these human characters in my Godzilla film. You know, like, I was like that same guy where he's like, I don't care about the humans. All I want to see is the monsters. But, like, the more that you think about it, it that's such a stupid thing to say because yeah, you, you, when you, you need watch people in exactly, Godzilla like, movies. One thing I that struck me so much in rewatching the 2014 MonsterVerse film as well as this film is that they are so much about the characters. They're about the human characters. Godzilla is a is a walking symbol, <laughs> you know? Like, Godzilla is not really a character. Uh, the characters are the humans. And I think that the goofy movies later on in the different eras of Godzilla have maybe trained people to think that Godzilla and the monsters are the stars of the show because, you know, it was so much about them fighting and the goofy antics that they, you know, went up to in the later films. And then, of course, when you look at the newer MonsterVerse films in King of the Monsters and especially in Godzilla vs. Kong, they really are the stars of the show in those movies. It really is uh, about them, partially because, you know, the human characters uh, are not well written. But that's a separate conversation. Back to the... I'm getting off... I'm kind of digressing, though. The 1954 film the human lives are so rich. Godzilla is terrorizing through town. Meanwhile, there's a romance going on between two of the characters. Like they're trying to sort of like get serious. You know, you have uh, the original Sarazawa in the 1954 film who was who was in the war and who suffered injuries in the war and discovers the oxygen bomb or whatever. Like you have the the father's character in Yanabe, is that his name in the film? Yamane. Yamane, excuse me. Yamane, uh Captain Yamane, I think is his name is, right? Captain? Doctor Yamane. Doctor. Oh Doctor Kyohei Do Yamane. <laughs> Doctor Yamane in the film is dealing with his own thing he's dealing with his children he's trying to he has a family during this incredible crisis but he's also dealing with like an unsolvable problem like what do you do like do you you know try to save people stop your country from being further destroyed by this unstoppable monster or do you try to find i don't know if i necessarily call it humane but it's but the more scientific the more intellectual way. Do you try to learn from this creature? And I think that that's really what the core of the film is about. Like the film is really about this question because Sarazawa kind of, you know, the same question is posed to him. You know, do you destroy the creature or do you, uh, you know, go with the more humane route? And the film comes to a really curious non-answer. That's not posed to Sarazawa. Sarazawa's the eye patch one. Right, no. Sar well, Sarazawa has to decide whether or not he thinks that the science should be used to destroy the creature and when potentially he's, destroy he's, even more. When he's pressed, it really is Yamane who is the the kind of struggle of the film because he presents the facts to the, the government, basically, to the public, actually. It creates this outcry of like we need to we need to kill this creature to save human lives, but then there's a very big contingency of like no, this is a living creature has a right to live, and he is struggling with like the creature kills people, and that's not that's not good. But I think that we should make peace with it 
if possible, because it's not its own fault that it's alive. It lives because of us. And right, so, that's another big part of it. That's a huge part of yeah, it that I didn't so even like, mention. And he does end up more on the side of um, not killing the creature um, until until the end of the film. That is such a complex, rich character. That is a fantastic character, in my opinion, far richer than a lot of the characters in the newer films. I think that Serizawa is an uh, important character because he kind of exists outside the bubble of Godzilla in the original movie. Like he has his lab where he's working on his thing and they keep coming to him to pester him about like, do you have something for us? And he's like, no, I don't. And then they leave and they're like, well, what else can we try? He's like doing his own research, his own thing off to the side. It's not until they really force his hand. Really, it's the it's the female lead that forces his hand. And that's when it's like, listen, we don't have an option. If we don't do this, like a lot of people are going to uh, to die and that uh, you don't want this to happen. None of us do. I guess now that we're talking about it, Sarazawa kind of represents a whole other element of this conversation, which is like complacency. I mean, obviously, I do think there is the element of the destruction that he's considering, which is one of the reasons why I don't think he really wants his science to be used for this militaristic action. Maybe complacency is not the right word, but it's the it's the thing of like good men who do nothing. Like he right, has no, something yeah. that can help, but his his conflict is revealing this weapon to the world. It's like it's kind of like what happened with with uh I, I believe it was with Einstein where it was like we invented nuclear war be, nuclear weapons because we were afraid the enemy would. And now that we have it, I don't know if we should. He's like I invented this because I was afraid that someone else would do it and they would not be a good person. But now that I have it, I don't think that the world should know about this this oxygen bomb. I feel that that's more of his struggle. Maybe not the doing nothing, but the the fallout of this new dangerous knowledge and technology to the wrong people. It brings up one of my favorite scenes in the film, which is when um, they're at Sarazawa's lab. He tunes in to the TV and he hears that choir singing and he sees the destruction on the TV. <laughs> I found it to be quite stunning. And I, I think that there aren't a lot of films in this genre. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that there aren't a lot of films in this genre that I think tackle issues that are this personal. That scene is kind of, it's one of those things that a lot of uh, movies try to do. And, you know, a, a few succeed here and there. But it's something of like applying texture to an otherwise hypothetical thought. So like the whole people could die is you, in your head, you're like, this is terrible. And then if you're like, no, you're putting voices to those people, and it's like children. This is your country. Your country will suffer. Yeah, like that's that was the 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 scene is like he it it gives him like oh no these these children could they could not be singing tomorrow. These women could not be with us tomorrow if we don't do this. And I think that's a very it's it's a great character moment in the film for someone who and he really doesn't occupy that much screen time like he's that's another thing it's like it's he's a well that's why i think it kind of works in the sense of the uh, complacency is one word for it isolation might be another word for it i mean sarazawa does isolate himself obviously and i mean that's partially due to the the trauma of the war i'm sure but for other reasons too i mean he already has such a richness in character we know he has a relationship to the female lead of the film whose name is <laughs> emiko emiko <laughs> I think if I remember correctly, they're arranged to be together, but she falls in love with uh, Ogata, the main character, and that kind of forms the conflict between those two characters is like is is their relationship with her, and then them having to put that aside. Look at that! That's so great. I think Godzilla is a very human-driven movie. You need people. You need to have the perspective of the lay person who is going against this this 
force of nature to give context. Otherwise, it's just a guy in a rubber suit. Asai, this has been such a fun, interesting, you really are just a well of knowledge of this film and the genre. I wanna keep talking about Godzilla. I wanna do the MFMI lightning round. This is when we just kind of give a speed round, if possible, of just some of your favorite things about this film. Um, and you know, try to give me the most impulsive answer as possible. You've seen this film so many times, so I'm sure you have maybe considered some of these questions. Can you give me your favorite scene? Yeah, so it's when Godzilla's rampaging through the city and he's destroying everything and you see composite shots of like people running away and then Godzilla destroying something. So there's like a scene with shot like overhead, people are looking up at the crane camera and they're like, oh my God, run, and they leave. And then when they leave, Godzilla's foot comes in and crushes everything. That's like one of the ones that sticks out to me. But the whole scene of city destruction Favorite set or location? Anything on a miniature set. I love I love building miniature sets because you can see how the effect was done. You know, you watch a scene in a miniature, they're like, okay, they build some small buildings and the guy in a suit stepped on it and they put some firecrackers over here. Those are more compelling to me in a sense of, I mean, when we first met, I was making movies. Not very good movies, right. but it, it's, movies it feels inspirational. Movies nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, it feels inspirational to me in a way that a CGI doesn't. If you have a favorite piece of trivia or behind the scenes from the film. The way the roar was created, um, I'm, Godzilla fans know this, but they were trying to figure out a way to cr give Godzilla a roar. And at first they were using like a tiger's roar. And they were like, no, because people know what that sounds like. People know what a bear sounds like. So we can't use that. We need something else. And... The way they made the roar was they took a glove, they coated it in resin, and they found a classical cello, and they loosened the strings, and they ran the glove over the strings. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's what was kind of publicly that's disclosed. Incredible. That's incredible. I had no idea that's how they did it. Oh my God, that like hits the music nerd in me and the sound nerd in me <laughs> and the film nerd in me all at once. Favorite experience watching Godzilla? I remember one of the times I watched it, I, I it was like a family friend and he had a home theater. And when I say a home theater, I, I don't mean like he had a surround sound system and a big TV. No, he had like a movie projector and he was showing it to us. I think it was on 35 millimeter, which I thought was like, the coolest thing ever. I was like, That's oh my God. That's incredible, like, yeah. Yeah, in, in terms of just like how awesome, like I could tell people like I watched it on film. Favorite response you've gotten from somebody when uh, you've told them that Godzilla is one of your favorite movies? I love being able to tell people that Godzilla is my favorite because there's so much to it. It's the longest running movie series of all time and it's the progenitor of modern tokusatsu as we know it and you see its fingerprints on everything, well, film, television, non-tokusatsu. You see it as an icon of Japanese culture. Like if you go to Tokyo, there's there's a building with uh, Gojira's head on it. And every <laughs> hour it blasts out uh, steam <laughs> like, uh, like it's atomic breath. They made Gojira a Japanese citizen and made it like an ambassador to the country uh one year so not one year but they they did does it does that mean that he could be arrested for war crimes now legally <laughs> now <laughs> no he's a, a citizen? He, he, he's an ambassador he's he's to spread oh, japanese culture to the corners of the world i see um, yeah so so he, I, he I gets think, uh he got uh pardoned <laughs> yeah i think when people are interested in why that's my favorite movie and like genuinely interested and they show an a, a appreciation for that that series uh, and that character and that film in particular. I think I, I love that. If you had to put a double feature together, one of the films is Godzilla. What is the second film? And I am only going to ask that you do not include any other Godzilla films. It should be Gamera, which is the giant turtle monster, not from Toho. So that would make sense. Those are like the top two uh, protagonist kaiju creatures in tokusatsu film. And my watch list has just been expanded. Asai, this was such a fun, awesome conversation. Thank you so much for being on the show. I want to give you a moment right now to 
let you plug whatever you want to plug. Where can people find you and your work? So I'm a Sinero Tran and everything. A S A I N E R O T R A N. I'm making YouTube videos about video games. YouTube.com slash a Sinero Tran. Twitter, same thing, at a Sinero Tran. If you want a video that has more to do about cinema, uh, I recommend my Ghost of Tsushima video that I made, which Larry. Larry also had a part here in uh, helping me proofread and draft up. It covers thematically and functionally what makes Ghost of Tsushima such a great game, such a great artistic experience, and its roots in Kurosawa's various pictures and styles and themes. That's a great video. I would definitely recommend that. Asai, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you. I hope to have you back on the show again, maybe sometime in the future. Thanks for being on the show. It was a pleasure to have you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Little Godzilla and I want to thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of My Favorite Movie Is. Godzilla, what'd you think of the episode, buddy? Yeah, well, that makes one of us. Shoot. Thank you so much to Asai Nero Tran for being on this week's episode and just schooling me on all things Godzilla. Check out his game reviews on his YouTube channel. And also, he didn't mention this during the episode, but he is on TikTok at Assign Nero Tran. So check him out there. And uh, also, by the way, uh, we we have a TikTok too. Uh, it's at MFMI Podcast. We're also on Twitter and Instagram. Follow us on social media for fun sneak peeks in between episodes, some bonus content you won't even hear on these episodes, and updates on when new episodes go live. Just a reminder, new audio episodes go live every other Monday, and the video version of that said audio episode will go up the following Friday. So, for example, if you're listening to this episode on the Monday in which it dropped, the video version of the Godzilla episode will go up this Friday. Friday. So uh, if you're listening to this episode within that time frame, uh, stay tuned. But if you're listening to this after the Friday I'm talking about, the video should be on YouTube. Isn't that amazing? I'm getting way too excited about this. Um, it's a really great episode, even in video form. There may be a couple little differences between them. So uh, be sure to check it out. And while you're on YouTube, subscribe, hit the notification bell, stay updated on when we post new video versions of every episode. And also, you know, follow us on your podcasting platform of choice. That way you'll get updated on when new audio episodes go live. There are so many ways to know exactly when new episodes of my favorite movie is are available just for you and, and the rest of our audience, but, but really just for you. For more information about our show, as well as a full catalog of audio and video episodes, you can go to our website, mfmipodcast.com. And if you have business inquiries or sponsorship inquiries, that would be pretty cool. Or if you have a question or you just want to say hi, or if you have fan mail, or if you have fan mail, or if you have fan mail, you can reach us at hello at mfmipodcast.com. In all seriousness, we're happy to help with whatever you need help with. If you have anything you need to know about the show, you can always email us there. But it was mostly it was mostly made for fan mail. This this outro has so much chaotic energy already. I'm I'm just gonna sign off. Uh, until next time, guys. Thanks for listening. My favorite movie is is a Larry Freed presents production. It is executive produced, directed, created, and hosted by me. Larry Freed is also produced by me alongside Brian Novak. Our assistant director is Steven Reyes, and our editors are Clayton and Kimberly Allen. Our graphic designer is Monica Sarmiento. Our motion graphics designer is Elton Greenfield. And our theme song, Now and Then, as well as all original music featured on this show, is composed and performed by Matt Gorduke. For this episode, our camera operator was Henry Strello. Our sound recordist was Sal Sisto. And our production assistants were Guillaume Moissonnier, Jillian Cohen, and Nate Almeida. Thank you all so much for helping to make this show possible. Everybody's social handles and websites and all that jazz is down in the show notes below. My name is Larry Freed, and this has been My Favorite Movie Is.